Netherworld Portals and Back to Hell The next morning I awoke in a less than stellar mood, exhausted from a night of tossing and turning. The things only got worse when I stumbled downstairs to find that my living room had been demolished. The furniture had all been unceremoniously shoved against the walls, and Miss Robbins had set a blackboard up and began scrawling bizarre satanic symbols all over it with chalk, while Sarah sat at rapt attention in a desk that looked like it had been stolen from her kindergarten. Next to Sarah's desk, gaped a large black pit with burn marks all around it. Every few seconds, Frank and Teddy would throw a Cheeto fruit into it and a large purple tentacle would shoot up from the darkness and catch it mid-air before slithering back down into the hole. The couch had somehow been transformed to red patent leather, and two large, rounded horns had sprouted from either side. I sighed, giving the hole in the floor a wide berth, as I went to the kitchen and grabbed a beer from the fridge before plopping down on my couch. I leapt up as I heard a sudden, Hey, watch where you stick that thing, come from beneath me. The couch decided it doesn't like to be sat on all the time, Daddy. Sarah said, turning and smiling sweetly up at me. Uh, okay, I replied dreamily. I suppose next the carpet will decide it doesn't want people to walk all over it. Sarah giggled. Don't be ridiculous, Daddy. I took a big gulp of my beer. The courage of the couch is to be commended. Frank and Teddy roared in his monstrous baritone. It has risen above its station in life and will soon dominate the humans that once saw fit to make it their seat slave. What? I began, but Miss Hatchetface cut me off. I have some more Cheeto fruit, Teddy. You get cranky when your blood sugar is low. No demon in hell has the authority to command me, but Satan himself. Frank and Teddy bellowed in response. I have some Cheeto fruit, silly, Sarah said. Okay, he replied. With that, he lifted up the wheelbarrow of the stuff next to him and tipped it down his throat. The sparrow squawked in protest, and Miss Robbins eyed the display with snobbish displeasure. Huh, I don't know why Satan thought that thing was an appropriate companion for a little girl. When I was her age, I kept an evil unicorn, a strider. Now that was a proper pet. Are you sure it wasn't a dinosaur? Miss Hatchetface asked, tipping her head to the side and putting on a plastic smile. Apparently, she hadn't taken it kindly when Miss Robbins had called her a strawberry tart the day before. And just what is that supposed to mean? Miss Robbins asked, swelling up like a bullfrog ready to burst. I believe the lady is implying that you are old, said Frank and Teddy. He wiped some Cheeto dust onto the couch, which let out a disgusted grumble. Yet the Lady Hatchet Face is approaching 17,000 years of age herself, he continued. Perhaps she is merely implying that you look extremely old. Yes, well, we aren't all half succubus and... Because of the wrinkles. Yes, I understand that my appearance... And the glasses. Yes, well, I need my glasses to... And the hunchback, finished Frank and Teddy. Miss Robinson's finger began to wag dangerously in Frank and Teddy's direction, and I decided I had better intercede before there was any trouble. Uh, so, I said a little too loudly, what exactly are you guys learning today? We are learning about the fundamentals of demonic possession, Miss Robbins replied. And afterwards, perhaps a lesson in etiquette for you, Darren. It is not polite to interrupt the teacher's lesson. Right, uh, and what about the giant squid hole in my living room? We opened a portal to the netherworld, Daddy, Sarah said, with the casual ease of someone explaining what they'd had for breakfast that morning. It's like Hell's Basement. It houses all the incomprehensible beings that existed in the black void of nothingness before the creation of the universe. Huh, I replied taking another large gulp of beer. 
Just then, a low, rumbling growl emitted from the hole, shaking the picture frames off the walls and sending cracks snaking from floor to ceiling. Could we maybe shut that? We haven't learned how to shut portals yet, said Sarah. <sighs> okay. I took another sip of beer, then realized that it was just air because the beer was already gone and wandered off into the kitchen to see if I could scrounge up something resembling a human breakfast. I opened the refrigerator, and my hair blew back as a deep, infernal roar erupted from within. I slammed the door shut. Sarah, I called out to the living room. Yes, Daddy? Did you open a portal to the netherworld inside the refrigerator? Yes, Daddy. I sighed and rubbed my temples as I was lamenting the destruction of my living room and kitchen. A sudden idea occurred to me on how to deal with my demonic denizens, ever increasingly suspicious behavior. I realized that if I were to get to the bottom of this, I'd have to visit Satan. After all, it seemed logical to assume that if there was some sort of evil scheming going on, he would be the one behind it. And, of course, there was that tour of hell where he had clearly wanted to get rid of me so that he could talk to Sarah. And, perhaps most importantly, he was also the one who buzzed me down to hell every time I called his customer service department with a complaint. At first, that had irritated me, but now I realize that it could be an opportunity for me to do some snooping. I slid my phone out of my pocket and hit the number for Hell's customer service hotline, which by now I had saved under the contact name of Instant Migraine. It was picked up after one ring, and the familiar, tired voice of the customer service representative answered, Welcome to Hell's customer service. How may I hell you today? You know that joke's getting pretty old. You don't say. Why don't you come up with something better then? Seems like a lot of effort. The voice on the other end sighed and mumbled something about lazy writing. <sighs> Is this Mr. Rogers again? She asked, her tone telling me that she already knew the answer. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to talk about a portal to the netherworld in my... Please hold. And the line clicked and I noted with some confusion that the whole music was the song Jingle Bells. The line clicked again, and Satan's enthusiastic voice answered, Derek, buddy, how are things up there on Earth? It's Darren, I said, and things are not so great given that there's a huge gaping pit to the netherworld in the middle of my living room. Oh, well, that's no good. Is Gary down there? Who's Gary? Gary is the giant octopus whose ink is the source of the universe's dark matter. Well, there is a giant octopus. All right. Well, I'll send someone to close that portal up right away. How does Tuesday work for you? Satan, it's Wednesday right now. I meant the Tuesday after next. The front of my brain began to throb with frustration. Satan, there's a giant octopus living beneath my living room who could squirt dark matter all over my furniture at any moment. Can we please talk about this face to face? I, uh... Satan's voice trailed off. I'm a little busy right now, Derek. Don't worry, though. I'll send somebody within a few months. What happened to next? Uh, no, you know what? Buzz me down. Okay, but I'm not at the office. I began to ask just where he was but my voice was drowned out by the roar of the black and purple fire that swallowed me whole, sucking me down to hell like human-flavored soda through a straw. I landed hard in hell, stumbling across rusted red dirt and cracked volcanic stone as I tried and failed to regain my balance, crashing and banging my knees on the rocks. I pulled myself into a sitting position, and stared around in awe in my surroundings as I wondered where I was. I sat at the edge of a sheer cliff, and below me was what looked like a colossal construction site, where giant, purple-skinned behemoths hauled around girders made from the ancient, 
yellowed bones of some even larger beasts. From my perspective on the cliff, I could see that the demons were laying down a monumental pentagram, flat across an enormous expanse of blood-red sand. Torches stood at each of the six points, made from dark oak trees so tall and wide, they seemed as if they could have held up the earth itself. I looked up to see Satan standing beside me, eyes squinting tight as he surveyed the work. His two polished black horns poking through holes in a plastic canary yellow construction hat. Hey, Derek, he said, smiling down at me. What are you doing on the ground? I scrambled up to my feet, made a poor job of brushing the dirt off of my trousers, and looked at Satan. I, uh, my voice trailed off. Now that the first part of my plan had actually worked, I realized that I hadn't given any thought to what the next part was. Uh, what are you guys building? Oh, this? Satan grinned. It's a park. I looked down at the enormous structure that the demons were laying down in the sand and noted the conspicuous absence of anything remotely park-related. It's a park in the shape of a pentagram? I asked. Well, I mean, this is hell, Derek. It's Darren, actually. What's Darren? Uh, never mind. Okay, Derek. But as you can see, we're a little busy down here in hell, and I can't really afford to send anyone up right now to fix the portal in your living room. Why don't you just ask Miss Robbins to do it? Miss Robbins knows how to do it? I asked, momentarily forgetting I was on a fact-finding mission. Why didn't you just tell me that over the phone? Well, you seemed like you were in an awful hurry to get down here, Satan replied. I thought that maybe you missed me. What? Satan's shoulders ever so slightly slumped. Oh, nothing. Is there anything else you need, Derek? As I've already said, I'm a little busy here. But you're not doing anything. You're, you're just watching other people work. You're damn right, Satan replied. I'm the boss down here, and the boss's job isn't to work. It's to watch other people work and silently project the idea that they're not doing a good enough job. Uh, anyways, I'll see you soon, Derek. You will? But Satan didn't respond. Instead, the familiar black and purple flames licked up around me, and I once again felt the sensation of being sucked through a straw as I rocketed back towards Earth. I landed back in my kitchen, elbows and knees banging hard against the linoleum floor. I struggled back to my feet and saw that the portal in the living room had been sealed and that Gary the octopus was gone, although the burn marks on my carpet remained. Satan called while you were on your way up, Sarah explained. He told Miss Robbins to seal the hole up because you didn't like Gary. That wasn't a very nice thing to say, Daddy. But I didn't. An infernal roar sounded from somewhere deep below the earth, shaking the frame of the house around us. I think you hurt Gary's feelings, Daddy. You should probably apologize. My fingers once again found my temples and began massaging as I squeezed my eyes shut against the chaos that had become my life. I didn't know what to do. Not only had I come no closer to finding out what Satan was up to, but every time I turned around, a new monstrosity was invading the peaceful suburban tranquility of my home, and I still hadn't eaten my breakfast. My eyes had been shut for all of ten seconds, when I heard an earth-shattering loud bellow in my ears. You appear to be suffering from a headache. Perhaps I can assist you. Frank and Teddy was bent down, his face so close to mine that I could count the individual crumbs of Cheeto dust at the corners of his mouth. No thank you, Frank and Teddy. I'm just fine. Very well, he replied. He turned around and opened the refrigerator door, digging through the snack drawer with reckless abandon. I was going to tell them that there were no Cheetos in there when I smelled cigarette smoke 
I scanned the living room and saw that the couch had a cigarette stuck between the middle cushion and the frame and was carelessly puffing away. Who gave the couch a cigarette? I asked. Everybody looked around the room at each other and collectively shrugged. I power walked over to the sofa and snatched the cigarette out of its mouth, stomping it out on the already thoroughly ruined carpet. No smoking, I said to the couch before turning to Miss Robbins. And as for you, I said... I don't want to come downstairs to find any more portals to the netherworld in my living room, nor do I want to come down to find a couch that talks and is suddenly useless to sit on. Miss Robin swelled indignantly. My teaching methods? Your teaching methods are just fine if you're teaching in your own home, but as long as you are teaching here, not to mention staying in the guest bedroom, you're to follow the rules of my household, which and I can't believe I'm actually saying this, includes a no portals to the netherworld clause. Miss Robbins glowered at me like she was a frog, and I was a stubbornly agile fly who had just danced narrowly out of her reach. Luckily, she must have decided that she was too offended for words, because she said nothing. Instead, storming off upstairs, her reptilian tail thwapping each step as she went. You know... The couch said, cushions flapping up like a mouth. You're useless to sit on too, but you don't hear me throwing it in your face. I decided that didn't merit a response. I believe that the Lady Robbins was wounded by your words, Frank and Teddy bellowed. Unfortunately, I do not believe the wound to be fatal. I sighed and wondered if it was too early to grab another beer from the fridge. But first, I had something important to do. <sighs> Sarah, I began wearily. I'm sorry I interrupted your lesson. It's okay, Daddy, Sarah grinned, and her bright blue eyes brimmed with careless joy. I was ready for a break anyway. Can I go upstairs and play tea party with Frank and Teddy? Of course you can, honey. Awesome, Sarah squealed streaming upstairs in a little girl-sized blur before pausing at the banister and shouting at Frank and Teddy. Come on, silly. Yes, Princess Sarah. I heard the stairs creak in protest as Frank and Teddy's immense frame lumbered up them. A moment later, Sarah streamed back down the stairs, tripping over the last few steps and tumbling head over heels. She leapt back to her feet and ran over to me, shoving something in my hand. I looked down to see a golden signet ring with the letters BFF on it. What's this? I asked. It's a super BFF friendship ring. I've got one too, see? She waved her hand in my face, and I saw that she did indeed have an identical golden ring, only several sizes smaller. Miss Robbins gave them to me, she explained. All you have to do is put the ring on and rub it, and it'll instantly transport you to wherever I am. Cool, right? I stared down at the ring in wonder. It was more than just cool, it was a single father's dream. I smiled at Sarah and said, Yeah, it is cool. I slid the oversized ring under my finger, and it instantly shrunk down to a perfect fit. Thank you, honey, I said. I love you. I love you too, Daddy. She giggled before shooting back upstairs to her tea party with Frank and Teddy. Miss Hatchetface came up and placed her hand gently on my elbow. How is your head, Mr. Rogers? She asked. Uh, it's okay. I lied. Are you sure? Maybe I could make you a snack and that would... No. I shouted out reflexively. Miss Hatchetface's eyes widened in surprise. I just meant... Uh, my mind stalled as it searched for an excuse. I'll feel better once I get this mess cleaned up in the living room. Oh, okay, Miss Hatchetface said cheerily. I'll help. We made our way over to the miniature mock classroom. Miss Hatchetface to the blackboard and me to the desk. Miss Hatchetface lifted the blackboard over her head and began carrying it towards the garage. But I didn't touch the desk. I was looking at what was on it. 
as Sarah's notebook lay open. The page she had been taking notes on had been ripped out, but there was something familiar in the indentations that had been left on the next one. I took the pencil she had left on the desk and began to edge it lightly over the grooves in the paper. When I had finished, I was staring at something I'd definitely seen before, five minutes ago in fact. A large pentagram dominated the page, with little archaic symbols scrawled into the gaps. It was the exact same shape as the monument I'd seen under construction in hell.